Welcome to our latest edition of the Infinigate UK Virtual Summit Series. Um, we had a couple of uh, technical difficulties back there, as you may have noticed, but um, I think we're all okay now. Um, this time around, uh, if you've been on our previous webinar series, you'll know that we tend to follow a, a theme, and uh, this time around we're following the theme of cybercrime. Um, and I also have joining me today um, a couple of uh, panelists with me. Um, I obviously am on the call myself uh, facilitating this discussion today. My name is Chris Payne. I'm a CEO of Technology from Finnegate. I do have um, two highly esteemed colleagues with me. Uh, I've got uh, Ken Munro. Ken, are you on the line? I uh, sure am. Excellent. Thank you for joining us today, Ken. Um, Ken, I, I remember I kind of first came across you at this year's uh, InfoSec event. There was a lot of... Um, a lot of kind of interest in your, your stand. You were doing a, a live hack of a, a Wi-Fi enabled kettle, I think it was. I think even BBC News were, were, were filming around the stand at some point. Uh, so particularly exciting, I think, um, part, of, part of the show. Did you want to um, just kind of give a brief introduction to who you are, uh, where you work, and, and the kind of, um, kind of experience you have in the industry for us? Mm, yes. Yeah, so, um I work with a team of pen testers. Um, as you probably saw at the InfoSec show, we take a great deal of interest in the Internet of Things. Um, so at the show, we were playing around with a Wi-Fi kettle that's, um, if you put it on your home Wi-Fi network, someone could drive past and steal your Wi-Fi keys in plain text. Brilliant, hey? Um, other things we're looking at later in this later this week, we've got just got hold of an Internet-enabled washing machine. You might have seen it being advertised on the TV recently, so that's um, subject to a big... Uh, uh, research projects uh, over the next few days, so that should be fun. But I spend most of my time, the day job's about um, penetration testing, so working with organizations, finding where the bugs are, helping them get them fixed, and uh, hopefully leaving them with a clean bill of health. Excellent, thank you for that introduction. Um, and we also have on the line, um, but, but in no particular order of course, we're, we're joined by Amar Singh. Um, hi Amar, are you on the line? I am, yes, hello. Thank you. Okay, so those bugs we had earlier are all fixed out, all fixed now, and we've actually got everybody on the line. I'm glad to hear that. Um, so I must admit, Amar, I was given um, your bio to, uh, you know, I had to fit everything on these slides in preparation for today, and the, your your list of, of kind of accolades and everything you've been doing in the industry, I, I struggle to fit, fit into three lines, so I do hope that I've done a good enough job for you. Um, but would you be able to also just give an introduction as to your experience and, and, and what, your, what your role tends to be? Yeah, sure. Thanks for that. I mean, I'm just trying to do my, you know, um, trying to help the cyberspace community, I guess. Um, I've been in information security for very long. I do a lot of interim CISO work. I'm the founder of Give One Day. Um, it's a not-for-profit movement uh, helping uh, charities, or rather supporting charities in cyberspace. So we've helped several of them. Uh, some of them can't be named, but some of them we are working with. Um, I also am the founder of... Uh, Cyber Management Alliance, but yeah, I, I do a lot of uh, uh, consultancy. Uh, you know, I know Ken and uh, everyone else in this place. So ho hoping we enjoy this and hoping the audience enjoys what we have to say. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and it's a pleasure to have you both on the call as well. I mean, I, I certainly don't stack up against you guys in terms of experience. So a little, little bit of inadequacy here, but um, but of course that's not what we're here to do today. So I'm going to uh, for everybody on the call um, that's listening in is we, we're just going to be drawing on both Amar and Ken's experience in the industry, um, maybe to gain a little bit of um, more knowledge around topics such as the mentality of cyber criminals, um, who these people tend to be, um, you know, their kind of their profile, their motivations, things like that. How they operate, I'm sure people are, you know, very interested in how uh, some of these attacks take place, what, what are their tools of choice, um, things like that. Uh, what an attack actually can constitute. You know, there's a lot of kind of news um, and media at the moment um, telling us that um, they've seen things like SQL injections, theft of data, phishing emails. Which are the areas that we should actually be looking at in a bit more detail? Where the actual threats are? Um, and of course, you know, how do you deal with this? Uh, we all know working in security that you know uh, it, it's not a it's not a foolproof game. You you can't you can't have anything that's 100%. Um, Safe, and what do you do on the occasion that something does go wrong and a breach takes place? So that, that's going to be our, our kind of our run through today. Um, also, you'll see on my last bullet point here, we do have an active Q&A session taking place throughout the call. So uh, on your GoToMeeting panels, you will have the ability to submit a question based on what you're seeing on today's call. Um, if you'd like to do that, please do fill it in. Um, towards the end of the call, we'll be giving some of those questions across to Ken and Amar for them to answer. So um, hopefully that, that should be uh, great for giving you guys some feedback on some of your existing um, issues. 
Also, to aid in our discussion today, um, we have put together a fictional organization. Um, we're going to run through um, a scenario. So we have a, a disgruntled customer um, for some particular reason. Maybe they, they haven't um, had the service they, they expected from the organization, and they threaten to perform some kind of um, cyber attack against them. So we're just going to run through that as a theme and, and give us some kind of visual representation around what we're talking about. So profile on the organization, a small travel agent, Ferrier Limited. Um, they've refused to give a refund to a particular customer, and this, this organization has a number of web-based services which are you know, potentially vulnerable in this situation. But we'll keep that theme flowing throughout. So uh, Amar and Ken, how, how does that sound for you guys? Are we, are we happy to, to go with that? Sounds workable, yes, definitely. Awesome. Excellent. OK, so the first thing really is, um, is to talk about who the cyber criminals are. So, um, you know, I actually Googled this subject before creating this slide. And of course, if you Google cyber criminal, you get lots of pictures like our viewers can see on the screen right now, people in balaclavas, um, <laughs> on laptops, which of course is a media-driven image. Um, the other thing that we're used to seeing is the kind of the, the um, joking image, you know, kind of the teenager in the basement, uh, the, the annoyed society kid that, that's also doing the, the attacking. But um, you know we're all pretty aware of that normality. A uh, question to you, Amar. I, I know you've presented fairly widely on this particular subject. In your experience, is there such thing as a typical cyber criminal, and, and what are the general motivations? Why? Are, why? What kind of pushes these people down those paths? Um, it's actually a very, very good question, and I, I keep getting asked that. And um, at Infosec this year, I was at a stand and I was invited to talk. And what I did was I did a completely unplanned, random survey of everyone walking through you know, the uh, InfoSec. And what was fascinating was my question to everyone was, given that you could spend 50 or $100, I know you're going to talk about that a bit later, um, if you could buy a very cheap hacking tool, you know, what would motivate you to attack your company or your friend even? And um, you know, I was expecting a response to the you know, in in the in in uh, by by most people saying, oh, we would never do that. And what really surprised me on both the days that I took this kind of unscientific um, you know survey, everyone I put the microphone to said they would consider attacking either a friend or their organization. And the motivation, the key word here is motivation, ranged from anywhere between revenge, fun, to prove something right agitation you know or being just being unhappy with uh, the current environment that they were in and that completely blew me away personally because I was I, I until then actually imagined that there was only a certain type of hacker right um, as you say that was that most of the attackers and, and even the media portrays it um, you know are, are bored teenagers a lot of the time but this particular survey and many of them were very respected people um, in fact, there was one one young chap who said he had actually done that, and uh, we didn't ask him his name, <laughs> um, but he admitted to having attacked one of his friends using a tool that he purchased um, on on uh, on on cyberspace or in cyberspace. So, actually, to be honest with you, it's everyone could be an attacker, and that's kind of a bit scary. Excellent, thank you. And that, that kind of correlates exactly what I was going to put on the slide. So uh, I've just put a couple of um, items up here around some of the most common forms of um, attacker, I guess, we see in terms of profile. But as you absolutely say, it could potentially be anyone. Um, so it, it feels a little bit like family fortunes here, and I think you've got the highest points if, we, if we're going to play that game. Um, but uh, so, so Ken, just something over for you, really. I think most people envisage an external threat when it comes to cybercrime. Um, and but particularly some more recent highlighted events, and I'm, I'm kind of pointing the finger now at the Ashley Madison case uh, that we saw recently, we, we tend to see quite often now um, the idea of it being an insider threat. So I, I guess the question to you is, how common is it that we see insider threats? And, and do you think organizations are generally too focused on attackers being on the outside? So I think the problem we have is that a lot of the coverage we see in the press is based upon breach data that primarily comes out of the US. Um, it's fairly rare, by comparison, to see um, breach data coming out of the UK, and that tends to lead us to, to build a certain picture of what the hacking threat is. You know, it's yeah, we we understand that there are foreign actors at work here, but 
the breach data that we see, the breach data that's out there in the public domain tends to be based upon US-based loss cases, which tends to be an external attacker or maybe a, a supplier, or, but actually by far and away the most common is the inside actor, whether it's someone who's just a bit unhappy, disgruntled, being bribed, being coerced, being paid or whatever. Those are some of the most significant thefts that we see. And I think we have to treat every interaction we have as a business as a potential threat and then design security to, to mitigate that as best we can. Yeah, perfect. And I would say certainly from my own experience, just based on what you, you've mentioned there, Ken, uh, a lot of organizations that I go into to provide consultancy services, th their main focus is on the external threat. And it tends to be an afterthought or even after something has happened that they tend to think of that insider threat. So I, I, think, I think you're completely right there. Um, okay, so back to our scenario then. Um, in, in our particular scenario, we've got our disgruntled um, customer. Um, he has no real experience in, in the world of um, cyber uh, crime and, and, and so needs to go and look for some form of help. Um, now, I've, I've got a kind of slide here on that. Now, Ken and I actually, prior to, to this webinar today, we obviously went through a practice run, as, as you do when you're conducting these types of things. And um, Ken quite rightly pointed out to me that um, most of the tools that people can use in order to conduct some of these types of attacks are available just kind of you know, on the regular web. However, I think that the media has put quite a lot of attention recently on what we know as the dark web. And so I just wanted to kind of give a little bit of information for anybody that is on the call that's not aware of what that is. Uh, just a bit of information as to what it is, just to maybe clear up some of the, uh, the, the kind of the negative uh, kind of connotations around that. Uh, so what we, what we have here is... Um, it's essentially a, a parallel internet in some respects. So, so if we look at the regular internet, we've got a, a laptop on the left, tries to get to a website and works through the internet, you know, the mesh of routers and infrastructure in the web in order to get to that site. That's what we're very, very used to. Um, the difference is, is that there does exist out there some servers which contain content, maybe um, not legal, um, should hidden require some anonymity. Um, and so we tend to refer these as being on the dark web. And the only way to access those is through a special browser uh, which routes you through hidden infrastructure giving you access to those services. Now, anybody that's familiar with this or if they've heard any of the media information about this, you'll know that there's been um, a lot of coverage around some of the things that you can buy on the dark web, so things like drugs, um, uh, things like weapons, for example, people have been purchasing on there. And of course, things like access to botnets. Um, access to hacking tools, things like that. And most famously, uh, we have the example of a website known as Silk Road, which was shut down but has kind of returned in, in many a guys um, recently and, uh, and beyond uh, when it comes to the dark web. So uh, one thing I wanted to do for this was just to bring some kind of reality to our presentation today. And one of the things I did was to actually go onto the dark web using the Tor browser and actually have a look at myself and, and, and see um, what was out there, what was available for purchase. And what I found very interesting was um, you could actually buy hacking services, so it was hackers for hire in some respect, um, advertising their prices freely online. I mean, all I did was download the browser and then search for this. So we've got a guy here that I found. He's prepared to give you his time for £141. Um, and that's pretty much, I wouldn't say anything, but he'll, you know, he will make use of his skills to try and um, get you what you need. Uh, what I thought was particularly interesting, though, was that he even had a, a load of reviews as well. It was, it was almost like an eBay shop. Um, you know, he's got five stars. This is a guy that's clearly done a very good job for some people in the past. Um, and, and if you think about it, the value of that is very, very low. Um, so one thing just to kind of think about here is I've got a couple of the other prices that I came across whilst I was doing some research for this particular subject. And I wanted to get your opinion on this, Amar. I mean, when you look at these prices, and we have to realize these prices are particularly low, um, what, you know, how do organizations, how, how does it affect their risk strategy when they look at these prices and they see the tiny value that cyber criminals are placing on these types of attacks? Um, you know, that's a really great question. And and uh, I think even Ken was referring to it. I think the problem is organizations are being led a lot by the media. So, you know, if they hear something, uh, a, a recent attack, and they, will go, they may go out and buy a product just for that particular attack. So what I tell my clients is before you go and buy anything, you need to understand, ask yourself, how would you destroy your own business? It's a very important question, right? And I don't think many people actually have thought about that. How would you destroy your own business? Now, 
you could call it risk analysis, you know, but these are questions that start to generate a story. I'm sure they knew, uh, or hopefully they knew, how someone could destroy their business, you know, their key intellectual property. Um, and once an organization knows that, it's only, I guess, then can they start taking a pragmatic approach. And the problem is, a lot of the time, uh, protection seems to be the only uh, only mechanism to protect against all of these kind of uh, hacking tools. And people forget to look at the uh, detection and response mechanism. So, so I think they need to take organizations need to take a step back, understand what are their key assets, how would they destroy their business, but at the same time also focus on response on detection. Excellent. And I just wanted to also return back to that piece about the media almost um, you know leading businesses down a particular road and that almost that scaremongering piece. Um, you know, Ken, when we when we watch media, when we when we see some of these items that are appearing in the news, you know, it, it seems like things are just constantly getting worse. Um, and, and there's almost this apocalyptic vision that one day this is all going to come together and the you know the, the entire IT security industry is going to be overwhelmed by a flood of hacktivisms and, and, and attackers. Um, you know, will it, will it ever be possible to eliminate the threat of cybercrime entirely? So uh, uh, let me deal with the first point you made there about it um, generally getting worse. Now, yes, the issue is getting worse, but perhaps not at the same rate that we might perceive because the press has picked up on cybercrime, roused it, uh, it sells papers and uh, gets viewers. So there's a lot more coverage there. But most importantly is the change of legal frameworks a few years ago, um, particularly in the US, to require mandatory breach disclosure notification. And that's a really, really big point because these breaches happened before. And they just weren't reported upon because organizations, if they knew they'd been breached, would you disclose it to the world? Would you affect your share price if you didn't have to? So yes, it's getting worse, but perhaps not at the same rate that we might perceive. Is it going to be possible to eliminate? Nope. Um, I think it's an arms race. It'll carry on. We haven't eliminated war, so cybercrime will continue. But what we can do is um, make it more difficult to hack um, our organizations so that the hackers focus on somebody else. Perfect. Thank you for that answer. Okay, so back to our scenario then. So we've got our irritated customer. He's, he's taken that offer of £141 for his hacker to hire, for hire um, which is obviously a ridiculously low price. And now what we're going to do is follow the actions of the attacker themselves. So uh, typically, um, like any organizational um, infrastructure and their network, they've got um, some outward facing services. In this particular case, we've got a VPN service then that's not important in this particular case. And we've got co-workers, employee laptops, uh, handheld devices, things like that, that happen to go in and out of the network on a, on a particular um, time frame. Um, so one of the things um, that, that we're going to see is, is a to-do list effectively from our attacker. So the first thing that we're, we're going to see from our attacker is the, the desire to want to perform some kind of a targeted attack. And in, in order to do that, our attacker is going to use social media sites um, in order to find a victim. So, uh, in terms of social media sites and finding victims, Amar, a question for you: um, Social media sites, uh, particularly career-based versions such as LinkedIn, are we are we really just asking for trouble by advertising so many details about our lives? I mean, it's pretty easy for me right now to go to Google and find, say, the security officer for a particular organisation. Um, people who work in sensitive fields, what, what you know, what should their approach be around social media? <laughs> I don't think uh, there would be any agreement. You know, to this answer, but uh, you remind me of a, a, story, um, a real incident about two years ago. Obviously, no names, but uh, customer, and we just did a bit of checking around as uh, when I do my interim CSO work. And um, in a nutshell, there was an individual who had just joined the organization, senior position, and for whatever reason, um, he put up everything on LinkedIn and including all the projects that he was working on, the name of the projects, um, and all the cost codes and the budgets. So um, what do you say to that, right? Um, uh, um, when, when is normal sharing oversharing is the question, right? Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think LinkedIn is a great tool. I use it pretty heavily um, myself. But it is fascinating to see how many fake profiles turn up you know how many people just want to connect and uh, 
I, I, I was, I was uh, uh, it's quite funny, Ken, I was actually invited by the CEO of Barclays to connect uh, uh, two, two weeks ago. <laughs> and um, what was really worrying, folks, was that about 10 people in my network had already accepted that connection. It was a fake request, a fake profile. So I think the question here is every organization has, must kind of understand what is normal sharing and what is oversharing and kind of educate their employees as to their the appetite for oversharing or not. Absolutely, thank you. And, and in, in our particular scenario here, we're going to assume that something along those lines has actually taken place and our attacker has found somebody um, who, who, who's you know, maybe been slightly careless. Um, and what they, what they choose to do, our attacker, is to uh, set in some form of a targeted packet. So, the next thing that we're going to see in our scenario is the desire for the attacker to bring down that VPN service. Um, so they're going to use a botnet, they're going to, they're going to use a DDoS um, flood in order to do that. So we typically see a service being taken down. There you go. Um, what usually happens in this scenario is the entire admin team, the entire security team runs to one side of the organization to try and mitigate this threat and find out what's going on there. They kind of on panic mode. Um, when, when we see things like this happening, Kev, when we see this kind of attack in one direction and the, the entire admin team focusing their efforts on that side, you know, what, what tends to be the motivation here, especially in a time where you can just buy a DDoS mitigation solution? Why would an attacker do this? Well, it's quite simple. You want to distract the team for a period of time so that if you're doing something at, um, to attack an organization stage right, you get everyone else looking stage left. So the entire admin team are off dealing with the crisis that's brought down their e-commerce website that everyone's screaming about. So you deal with that. So you've got a distraction. Now, that's worked brilliantly in the past. However, what I'd say, this is a really, really good indicator of an attack for people now. So if you start suffering from a DDoS, Make sure not everyone's looking left. Make sure someone's looking right just to see if this is a distraction to keep you guys occupied. Excellent. I think, I think if I remember rightly, this was something that we used, was used actually fairly successfully in the, uh, the PlayStation Network attack that took, took place uh, I think it was a couple of years ago now, um, whereby they, they sort of took down a firewall for a set period of time, waited for um, the admins to run to one side of the building effectively, and then they would attack in the other direction. So yeah, I completely agree on diversionary tactics there. A um, couple of other things Chris, you've got on here. Sorry, down the... sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Sorry, just for your audience. This is uh, just in case someone is thinking this is not common. I mean, this is fairly common. It is happening more and more. Um, and uh, just for the audience to keep note that actually this kind of activity is definitely a, becoming a very common occurrence. Excellent. Well, thank you for that insight, Amar. Okay, so, so back to our scenario, so we've kind of taken the attention over to one side of the organization. Um, we've now uh, we targeted somebody's uh, laptop, we're going to send some kind of phishing email in, we're going to take control, um, and as Ken has alluded to quite rightly, uh, what we often see is a security team being looking in the wrong place, and, and we've effectively gained control of that particular laptop by placing some kind of malicious code on there. Um, so, so, Amar, uh, just a question here, because as you say, this is a fairly, you know, I think fairly typical, as you mentioned, this is a very common type of, um, of diversionary tactic and, and attack. In, in, your organ in your kind of your opinion, how commonplace is it for organizations to take note of these high profile attacks? And I know you've kind of mentioned this in a previous answer, but take note of these, these attacks and actually review their security. Is, is this something that actually does or do they tend to just react when their own organization has been attacked? Um, sadly, I would like to say the first one is the right thing, but sadly, even now, it's only when you know um, it hits home is when most organizations take a look. And just going back to the DDoS point, the 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 opportunity almost for an attacker from the DDoS perspective is it is it actually uh, poses a tangible impact on the client's services. So. What happens is it gains immediate um, visibility, right, at the board. Oh no, our our website is down, or customers cannot buy, you know, a VPA, or sorry, an e-commerce product. So the, the challenge is, and then a lot of effort, as as Ken was just saying, you know, everyone's looking left because the website or the VPN service needs to be up and running. Whilst that is happening, the intangible impact of someone maybe sending an email or whatever to compromise the phishing email as you're just saying, 
but that is intangible, right? It's, most of the time, it's just going to be an email, and no one's going to actually be impacted. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so in, in our particular scenario, we've got access to this device now. Um, we're going to cause some form of disruption because that's what the attacker has been paid for. But we do have a final action there, and that is the attacker is going to leave um, some form of dropper behind on the laptop. Now, we're actually going to come back to that a little bit later just to explain what that's for. Okay, so we have, a, we have a, a good little treat for you guys right now. Um, we've got um, Ken Munro, of course, on the call with us today, as you'll all know. And he has uh, offered to perform a demonstration of a reverse shell attack. So uh, we're obviously quite excited to show you that. So we're just going to switch controls to Ken now. So if you could just bear with us while we do that. Okay, Ken, I think we're making you the presenter now, so um, you'll need to just press that big blue play button on your go to Excellent. So we can see your screen right now, Ken. Excellent, that's good. So what I've got for you here is just a really simple demonstration of how easy it is to um, drop some content into an organization and get a reverse shell connection out of it. So yes, absolutely. If you want to go and um, spend money on buying a, a really subtle vulnerabilities um, on the dark web, fantastic. But there's some much easier ways to do that. If any of you have ever played around with Metasploit, I'm sure you've um, looked at some of the, uh, some of the uh, functions it offers. And one I want to show you is how easy it is to, um, to basically get something to connect back. Now, what I've got, this is my victim's desktop. I've got a virtual machine running here. And over here, of course, is my, uh, my listener. This is my um, connection waiting to come back. And what I've done is I set it up to use a reverse SSL shell, YHTPS, because everyone allows it. So if I send um, a connection to a desktop, it's very likely I'll be able to get a connection back to it. Um, over here in my other VM, I have got a spreadsheet. You mail it into an organization, you send it into your user, send something very simple, um, they open the spreadsheet, nothing much happens. What's actually going on? Well, what we've taken advantage of here is VBA, Word Macros or Excel Macros in this particular case. So VBA, some of you may well remember it, Visual Basic for Applications, it's a fantastic coding language. You can write virtually anything you want in it. And here we have a nice sort of obfuscated code which runs in the background when the macro runs and simply creates a reverse shell. So that's my victim exploited. All I have to do is nip over to my machine here. You can see I've got a session already. I'm going to start an interactive session with that one and start a shell with it. And sometimes you do that twice for some reason, never worked out why. And there we go. We've now got remote access to our victim's desktop. Really, really straightforward. Now some thoughts here, things you could do to stop this happening. First of all, we used VBA, so macros. So have a little think about your organization. Who uses macros? You might be surprised to find how few people in the organization do. So have a think about it. Why not block macros using group policy? Now, someone might say, hang on a minute, I use those in the finance department all the time to do my calculations. Great. So set up a group policy that just allows people by um, individual selection to use macros. This is a very commonly used way of getting a reversal into organization. Block macros, give it to people who need it, and only those who need it, and you block a significant attack vector into your business. Now, all we need to do is hand back. Okay, so I think we can do that for you, Ken. Let's just see if we can do that. Excellent. Look at that. Everything's working perfectly on this call. <laughs> um, thank you very much for that, Ken. I, I liked the name of the user you had there as well. I really saw that. That stood out. If you see misery on your network, you're in real trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I, I also uh, thought that it was, it was quite a nice also, uh, demonstration to an, an age-old technique, really, which is least privilege for the users that you have. They should only really have the privileges that they need to do their job. So as Ken quite rightly said, if they're not using um, uh, things like macros, then you know, limiting what they can do on that machine is a great way of limiting also what an attacker has access to. So fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Ken. Okay, so uh, if we go back to our scenario then, I didn't mention that we come back to this. We did, um, in our last slide, mention that there would be a dropper left behind on, on the device, and there is a particular reason for that. Of course, we have an irritated customer who has hired um, uh, an unscrupulous character, shall we say. Um, yes, he's taken money from them. Yes, he's performed the task he's been asked to, but that's probably not his only motivation once he gets access to um, a particular organization. So um, what we actually have is a dropper that's been placed on the network, and uh, we 
you know, our attacker has probably then loaded something in at a later, a later time. We've called back to a command and control center somewhere, and subsequently we've attacked and, um, and we've infected other devices on the network with this malicious code. So we've now potentially got access to a whole host of other devices in the network. Now, what tends to happen with this is um, you've got a command and control server somewhere that's dialing in, delivering code, taking back information, and possibly at a time when the admin team is not expecting it, late at night, or possibly when some, when, you know, another diversionary tactic is taking place, this attacker will actually start to siphon off that material. So, um, Amara, a question for you. What I've kind of described there is a, a fairly nightmarish situation for any organization losing sensitive data. Um, and it seems to be, at least in my scenario, to be taking place under the nose of the admin team and, and they're not really noticing this. Um, so I guess the question I have for you is, normally at what point does an organization become aware that it's lost some sensitive material? Do they only find out when an external party tells them? <laughs> That's a very good question. It's, uh, I would take out a couple of names of the media organizations is when something, you know, normally an organization finds out. Um, and the reason, as you mentioned, it happens, you know, just under the nose of administrators and, and organizations is going back to the question of least privilege, you know. Most organizations have no clue on who has access to what and who can do what in the organization. It's a fairly simple question. And, you know, if they did try to get on top of that, a lot of this activity would become a bit more difficult. And as Ken rightly points out, you know, many opportunist attacks, but then attackers would move on to something more easier to attack. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I've certainly been in a couple of organizations before where something's taken place and the, the IT team just sort of shrug their shoulders and say, well, we're not sure how. So no, I totally um, kind of relate to that particular scenario. So um, just, just one topic on one topic on that particular note, and this yeah, is kind of my experience with, with end clients, is one of the key things to drive home and take you know one takeaway again out of this is whatever happens, try not to accidentally delete any evidence. Because what happens is when the media suddenly publishes you know you, uh, your attack or your successful compromise on the on the internet or something a lot of things start to kick in and, and because many organizations don't practice response, a lot of the time critical evidence is deleted. And that really needs to be part of you know maintaining their logs, having a proper SIEM, etc. That is so critical. It's it's pretty passive when nothing's gone wrong. But having some kind of a SIEM logging infrastructure so that you can go back and try to see what happened. Is so critical. Yeah, some kind of evidence and, and of course some kind of um, plan as well is probably quite critical in that scenario as well so that people aren't just running around trying to fix things afterwards and as you say potentially deleting things and, and corrupting evidence. So I did a bit of research on this too. I mean we, we distribute for a number of vendors and, and a lot of them publish things like security reports every year and one of the things to take away from some of those uh, reports uh, and information they've correlated is um, some of the time frames in which it takes organizations to not just discover uh, that an attack or a loss of data has taken place, but also the time it takes them to remediate that particular um, problem. And we've got some statistics here, that, and I'll put a little citation in the bottom left-hand corner for you. Um, but 170 days typically to discover some kind of an attack has taken place, that's a huge amount of time. And 45 days to remediate. So we, you know, they know, they know this has taken place, and it's taken 45 days to kind of rectify the issue. Ken, um, you know, where do you begin to remediate once the horse has effectively bolted from the stables? I mean, you know, it's been 170 days, you've discovered you've lost data, now what? What, what do you typically do? Can I just take one step back from there? Because um, I think one of the key things um, when you're dealing with incident is actually make sure you have actually been breached. So we do a, a large number of forensic investigations, and I'm going to give two brief examples. The first one we were asked to look at um, was a member of staff had opened a PDF document which had created a reverse shell on the device, and the, the uh, organization covered it, and we were brought in to have a look and find out what had happened, um, and basically size up the scale of the breach. And after a bit of analysis of the malware, um, we cracked the encryption, decompiled it. We discovered that the IP address that it was connecting back to was part of a known CNC network and had already been taken down. 
So they hadn't actually been breached, they just had a reverse shell set up that hadn't resulted in the compromise. And the second one was a large banking organization, um, and they were very concerned because there was some um, traffic um, hammering around on their network that um, looked like breach traffic, looked like a, a connection. Just about to go to their regulator and um, disclose the fact they'd been breached, and when we pointed out that actually it was a misconfiguration on a switch, it was just causing traffic to be amplified and um, rattling around the network. So first, before you go there, make sure you've actually got a breach before you start going and telling your regulators and telling all your customers, because that would be a really bad thing to do, wouldn't it? Flag up you've got a breach, then try and retract from that position. But most importantly, if you have got a breach, analyze it, make sure you've secured your logs, and don't go doing anything silly like overwriting data or trying to run too many of your own scans on things. Something as simple as a, um, a file system analysis or running an antivirus scan can make a real mess of forensic images. <laughs> yes. Excellent, and that, I guess that correlates uh, particularly well with what Amar was saying um, uh, just in the previous answer. Uh, Amar, on a slightly different subject then, um, sometimes we hear a lot of stories, and this is something that particularly infuriates me sometimes, um, but you know, we hear stories about the, the cost of, uh, of, of an attack being lesser than, than what it costs to prevent it. Um, and, and so business is often not making the decision to, to pre put preventative controls in place. I mean, what's your kind of thoughts around that? Would you, would you say that's true? Um, I, think, I think the tide is going to change. It is changing. There have been several. I think what's really important is if you look at the recent, um, for example, one breach that comes to mind is the OPM, uh, the Office of Personnel Management, where... Uh, within a week or so, the director lost her job, the, the main person there. So um, the reality is, in my opinion, I think organizations are still wary of how much real impact. Yes, there's damage to reputation. Sony, for example, is one. Um, you know, uh, and the, the Ashley Madison is another one. But really, uh, at the moment, I don't think we are seeing the true impact of breaches coming through. I think in the next few years, CEOs and the board and shareholders will start to see significantly more actual impact. I mean, small organizations are definitely, uh, there are many examples out there, I'm not going to spend too much time, but there are many examples of really small businesses actually shutting down because of uh, cyber attacks. But the, the large ones, I think they are still uh, taking that risk-based approach saying, yeah, you know what? Um, it's only 500,000 pounds for a data breach in the UK as of today. So how much do we really need to invest? I think, uh, as you, I think you may be touching on top of that a bit, on that a bit later on, uh, regulatory fines and actual real uh, customers. Customers are the ones that actually need to decide um, and then show shareholders and, and businesses that they will not tolerate a cyber attack. Yeah, great link into the next slide as well. By the way, we yeah, so um, we have actually <laughs> we have previously conducted a, a webinar on the proposed changes um, to the. I mean, it's not changes to the Data Protection Act, but the, the EU regulations around data loss. Um, what, what we've seen in the past is that um, the Data Protection Act that we have in the UK currently is it's fairly inadequate for today's data-centric world. It's, I mean, if you look at the date in which it was created and the revision date, you know, times have moved on since then. Um, there's some statistics I've gotten here for comparing the older kind of um, laws versus the, the proposed. Um, Ken, what's your what's your views on these proposed changes? They appear to have some pretty um, scary teeth. Yeah, there's, there's some big numbers being being uh, talked about at the moment. Um, we should say that, it's, uh, to my knowledge, it's still a package rather than a directive. Um, it's still working its way through uh, the EU. Um, keeps being pushed forward and back, um, but it is a good thing because it gives us a framework that we can uh, set organizations up with so they understand truly at board level the consequence of um, mismanagement or poor management of uh, customers' data. Um, it'll give us uh, much better alignment with the way that um, data protection and customer data is looked after in the US, and also the frameworks for disclosure, mandatory disclosure, and also um, punitive fines. So um, when it comes, if it comes, um, I think it'll be a fascinating change to the, the landscape of information security in Europe. And we've seen a lot of interest from our, our, our customers as well around this particular area. I think we, when we've conducted webinars and, and, and given presentations on the changes, a lot of people just don't seem to be that aware of what's coming. 
Um, they know something is coming, but they didn't really know what the package involved. So it's, um, it's certainly something we like to, to push quite a lot and make people aware of. Amar, from a, from a, a kind of a business perspective, from a, from a boardroom perspective, are these kind of, is this legislation, these packages, are they welcome or are they just frankly annoying? Are they just, you know, are they just causing more red tape organizations? I think I, I, I welcome them personally, and I think Ken and uh, all of us are on a similar page. Um, I, I think uh, the businesses are definitely a bit annoyed, um, and possibly smaller businesses. You know, it's one of those challenges any small organization would face. Um, if I remember correctly, Chris, the 5% is now 2%. That is still pretty punitive also. Um, the, the, the global annual turnover, that was recently argued down to 2%, but as Ken also points out, it is still not confirmed. Right? But businesses and boards are almost being forced, and as any regulation is not always uh, welcomed, I don't think many businesses are necessarily welcoming the actual regulation. However, I think the cybersecurity community, the CISOs, who are trying to do the right thing, and the data privacy officers, I think they possibly are in the welcoming, saying it's about time something happened. Yeah, excellent. Some great insight there as well. Okay, so in our scenario, we've pretty much come to the end of um, our, our timeline now. So what we've, what we've effectively gone through is um, a fictional um, time frame where we've had a, an irritated customer who has hired some kind of help in order to cause some disruption. That attacker has then you know, gone on his own journey to steal some data. So the question that I have, and, and, uh, and I guess a lot of organizations would have if they suffered the same fate, in your opinion, guys, and, and I'll start, with, um, I'll start with, with yourself, Ken, how could Ferry have done better? What could they have done from a technical standpoint to lesser um, their exposure to these types of attacks? What would you, what would you recommend? So I think we all know many of the technical solutions to this is simple things like least privilege making sure we're up to date, making sure our passwords are strong. I, I think of security as being three simple things, patches, passwords, and people. Um, in my experience, when we're investigating breaches, even very large, significant breaches, it might be a zero-day use for the initial compromise, but actually the propagation of the breach inside is usually down to missing patches. A simple patch can be exploited, and from what was one compromise of one box on the system, all of a sudden it's the entire organization. You use passwords, the name master, local admin passwords, and you're in. Um, a couple of little tactical things I'd advise people to do. Um, we talked um, earlier about um, social networks and we talked about fake profiles. That's something you can actually turn to your advantage. Create a honey net. So think about creating some fake profiles on social networks like LinkedIn, for example, which have enticing job titles like the CFO maybe or someone in IT support. And see if you get people trying to hit those um, profiles. You might all of a sudden find you've got early warning of an attack. Really, really easy way. And another one, a really easy way to pick up um, activity on your network is install a honeypot. So a fake server that looks looks like it's vulnerable, but actually isn't. And it's too tempting. So the hacker, once they're on the first um, toehold into your organization, they'll need to do some port scans and some vulnerabilities uh, and some exploits. If they hit your honeypot, they'll set off the alarms and you'll know something's going on. So some, some things, yes, more complicated and policy-based, but actually some really simple, free, tactical things you can do as well. Perfect, thank you. And, and Ken, I have to admit, if my, if my uh, boss is on the line, I hope he's not hearing that, because I know, I'll know that will be in my queue for work tomorrow. So <laughs> <laughs> thank, thanks for that question there. Um, Amar, on a slightly different subject, maybe an area that's particularly interesting to me as well, is there seems to be a little bit of an increase in coverage over the idea of cybercrime insurance. Um, I think it's a fairly interesting idea. Is this something, again, that you, you think would be recommended to an organization like our, our fictional company would be Feria? Do you, do you think cybercrime insurance is worth it? Is it something that should be taken seriously? Um, if I may come to that just after I just uh, uh, also touch on, I think, and they are very related. I think an organization has to start with a baseline of they may be compromised or they will be compromised. I don't like to use the word will, the word will too much um, since we are all risk professionals. But I think it's almost as, yes, we are very likely going to be compromised. Are we prepared? And the question you ask is, are we prepared to respond to an attack? Now, part of the, part of the preparation for response may also be, depending on you know, how, how large you are, may also be insurance, cyber insurance. 
right? And I mean, that's a whole possibly several webinars that we can do. Um, but I think the question that you ask is really good. How do you prepare for an attack? And I think, you know, in my opinion, the answer to that is focusing on the fact that you will, your defenses, you know, will be breached, your firewalls, your, your VPNs, etc. Are you prepared? Have you done all the patching, as Ken was saying? And after you've done everything that uh, Ken was talking about, are you prepared to response? Do you have cyber numbers? Is it appropriate for what you're going to, you know, what assets you have? A lot of the time, um, I know many organizations personally. I know are looking at it, um, and you know, the, I think in the my customer split is 50-50. Some have gone for it and some are still not yet going for it because there are so many uh, clauses in the insurance have that actually don't satisfy a lot of the customers. Um, I would focus more attention of getting better, getting the senior management uh, prepared for an attack. And that, that answer is, can, is, your, is your management better educated about cyber attacks? Could I just add a little bit there about cyber liability insurance, if I may? Is that, is that okay, Chris? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think there are the two big areas of cyber liability insurance, probably the bit you see a lot in the press, the breaches that you see going through the media, that's typically a third-party um, liability whereby your customer's data is stolen. But by far the most common breach scenario we see when we're investigating fraud over here is actually theft of organizations' cash from their corporate bank accounts. And that's typically a first-party liability. What we find a lot is a standard theft policy you might think your theft policy um, covers you for theft of cash. Yeah, if it's physical cash, but if it's from your bank account, that's usually deemed a cyber event. So please, please go and check with your risk manager or whoever looks after insurance at your organization that you've got cyber liability cover for first party losses. So theft of cash from your business. You'll be amazed how cheap the cover is. And my experience is um, in this emerging field of cyber liability insurance, there's a general tendency towards all, um, underwriters to pay out in an emerging market. Perfect. Thank you very much for that, Ken, and um, yeah, that's, that's great insight. Um, just so everybody knows as well, we are recording this session. There's some great feedback that uh, both Amar and Ken have been giving. So, you know, if you haven't been jotting down notes or you did want to refer to anything that was spoken about in this call, we, we are going to record it and make it available. I just want to make you guys aware of that. Okay, excellent. So um, we're very close to wrapping things up now, but we did collect some questions um, throughout the call. So um, we, we, don't, we don't have a huge amount of time now. We have filled the, the call quite nicely, but I've got a couple of questions that I'd like to ask at least um, one each. Um, Ken, we, we've heard uh, a lot about the different types of attackers and, and threat actors out there, but on the opposite side, who, who tend to be the typical victims? <laughs> okay, so in my experience, um, it tends to be much smaller organizations. So we do a lot of... Um, uh, fraud investigations for companies that take credit cards that have been breached and have experienced credit card fraud through cards they've taken. Um, very small organizations, you know, farm shops, really tiny operations that are um, targeted in en masse, um, don't have the resources to invest um, in security, so they're a quite easy target. But that said, there are still a lot of much larger organizations that get compromised as well. I'd say that by far the greatest volume of tax though are right at the bottom of the scale in terms of small operators. Okay, fantastic. Uh, we've actually got quite a lot of questions that seem to be coming in right now. So what we'll do is, I'm just going to ask you, Amar, one question that we've got down here. We, we do have quite a few on the screen. Um, what I'll do, guys, is we'll get um, Ken and Amar to answer some of these questions afterwards, and we'll publish those on our website. So just so none of you, you know, feel that you haven't had your question asked. Um, so Amar, uh, just, just a question for you then. I, I've got a guy here asking a question. He says, how do I convince um, my organization's leadership team who are not taking the threat of cybercrime seriously? What can I do to convince them to? Well, that's uh, the, currently the million dollar question or $65,000, you know, whatever value you want to put to it. Um, my answer is, is educating the board, educating the senior management. And it's almost a chicken and egg situation. In some instances, they're going to say, why do we need to get educated about something like that? But um, I have seen personally evidence of if you can convince and educate your CEO, your CIO, the non-technical people, that there is a genuine possibility um, with a significant impact of a successful attack, it becomes easier then to start 
actually doing the right things. So simple answer, try to get the senior management educated on cyber and privacy essentials. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so guys, um, there's a lot of questions on here and, and obviously we can't get them all today. So we do have your email addresses and obviously the names of the people that submitted those questions. And I will ask Amara and Kenneth if of course they don't mind answering those questions. We'll, we'll get you feedback on them after the call, but we, we obviously have a time frame today that we need to keep to. So um, just, just last things um, from you guys and, and um, it's kind of looking into your crystal ball, I guess, in terms of the future. Your concluding thoughts. So we will be running a uh, an event later on in the year for our resellers and partners, um, and we'll, the theme is effectively the future of IT security. I guess I guess a kind of a very open-ended question for both of you. I'll start with you, Amar. What is your predictions for the future of cybercrime? Getting worse? Getting better? Um, how are the threats going to evolve? How are organisations going to adapt to that? What do you think? Um, well, I take a bit of an interesting view. I think there's no doubt that attacks are going to increase, um, as you know, Ken was in, uh, talking about IoT a bit earlier. As we all get more connected, um, you know, your fridge may have a fight with the microwave because the fridge thinks the microwave is too hot. Um, that's going to be a machine attack, no doubt. It will happen. It's just a matter of time. However, on a positive note, I do feel in the next five years or less, maybe that we may start having CEOs and the board starting to ask for, you know, the right thing to do in cybersecurity. Perfect. Thank you very much, Amar. Um, and Ken, the same question over to yourself, please. Yeah, I think what I've seen over the last 15 years uh, in this space is what used to be, what is a, a technically involved attack today requires high skill, tomorrow it's very quickly distributed and becomes something that everyone's doing. So the key is to keep moving, keep aware, keep watching because Windows Update, Patch Tuesday, Exploit Wednesday. You need to keep moving, keep aware and keep making sure that you've got least privilege out there and not doing anything silly like reusing passwords everywhere. That'd be a great place to start. Excellent, I like that. Okay, guys, so just um, just some final things from myself then. In every single uh, webinar that we create, we, we actually have some marketing everybody on the call. So these are available on our website right now. They've been available, made available this morning on our knowledge base. The first thing that we have is um, our cybercrime attack and defense battle cards. So kind of almost like in a top trumps style, we've actually created some attacks, DDoS attacks, uh, malware-based attacks, ransomware, things like that, and um, some of the mechanisms that we have in our vendor portfolio on how to defend against those. So just a little bit of a, I guess you could use it as an educational piece, um, a way to look at what our products can do to protect your organization. Go, go um, on our website, have a look at those, download them, print them, cut them out. It's, it's a great little resource that we've created. Um, the second thing that we have available for you is our attack remediation and action plan. So we've created um, a decision tree, so it's those kind of those things that you see a lot in magazines when you follow the yeses and the noes and you get to the answer that you need. Um, and it's really there just to provide you with some helpful advice post-breach as to what you can do, who you need to inform, and possibly what are the next steps. So those are the two marketing assets that we put on our website for you this morning. So please do go and check those out. So all that's left to say, um, guys, is um, of course a big thank you to both Amar and Ken. Um, I, I think you guys have been extremely insightful, um, very, very good uh, messages that you guys put out there today for us. Um, a reminder that we are recording this for anybody that's on the call that wants to review it later on. Um, and of course, uh, thank you very much uh, to all of our listeners that actually made it onto today's call as well. Final reminder, all those questions that you have asked, we will get those answered for you. So, um, yeah, goodbye, and uh, have a great day. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you on the next webinar. Thank you.